Welcome to The Apple Seed, where we bring you and your family great stories from great storytellers. On today's episode, we'll bring you a token of treasure. And they had the most beautiful pearl. It was the size of a baby's fist. And it was iridescent. And a dance of emotion. When that door first opened, it was as though a wave of love had come out of that place, almost like a tsunami. I'm your host, Sam Payne, and today's stories are about the things we treasure, whether they be pearls or laughter or friendship or love. Treasure is a matter of the heart. As the Bible says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Welcome, storyteller Shauna Lee, to the program. She comes to us from the UK, and she has in her repertoire thousands of Jewish stories that were passed down to her from her grandmother. Today, she'll be sharing the story, The Precious Pearl, recorded live in the Appleseed Studio. Here's Shauna Lee. Thank you so much. I'm going to tell you a story about a pearl, a very specific pearl. It's called the Precious Pearl of Bahrain. Now, this particular pearl, in in Jewish uh, mythology and Jewish folklore and wonder tale, pearls are very specific. Pearls stand for sorrow. Uh, They say that when Adam and Eve left the Garden of Paradise, they were given sorrow to cry. They were given the first pearls. There are 42 pearl stories and they say that these pearls are our way of dealing with sorrow because you always feel better after a good cry, don't you? (laughs) I know I do. And, And so this is called the precious pearl. There was once a king And he was beloved of his people, but it was also powerful. And so everybody wanted to court his favour. And emissaries would come from far and wide to give gifts. Now, he had a young wife. And that young wife, well, we have a saying in, in, in England. She was a bit giddy. I don't know if that translates well, you know. She was like, oh, stuff! Oh, that's for, oh, squirrel! Just, just a bit giddy, you know. Lovely, but she just loved stuff. When I got married, my husband said, uh, I had completely underestimated a woman's need for stuff. I said, well, now's your learning curve. <laughs> so so uh, she just loved stuff. And she lived for these presents. Now, he didn't want all of these presents. There was, between the great throne room, a lattice, a a piece of wood that had intricate patterns in that you could see through. And whenever there was uh, an emir or an advisor that was presenting something, she would creep up. She would peer through with her serving maid. And if something really was beautiful, like a a roll of silk from the east or perfumes of sandalwood and a tar of roses, she couldn't stop herself. She'd go, (gasps) (laughs) And the husband would smile. The king would smile because he could hear it. He knew she was there. And he would make a note and he would say to his servants, make sure that gets delivered to the queen. Now, one day, there came an advisor from Bahrain and they had the most beautiful pearl. It was the size of a baby's fist and it was iridescent and it seemed as if rainbows moved over its surface and dark grey clouds. It was the most beautiful thing. And, of course, she's watching and as soon as she saw it... (gasps) She couldn't stop herself. (laughs) But, you see, the king, he didn't ask a lot for himself and he just had a a royal scepter made and this was going to be perfect on top of that. 
And so the Queen, she waited, and it never appeared in her quarters. <laughs> and then it still didn't appear in her quarters, and, and then it didn't appear a bit more. And, and then she sent her maid to investigate, and she came back, she said, Madam, he's going to have it put in the scepter. And she went, because she was very young, but I want it. <laughs> I want that pearl. She said, well, madam, maybe you can't have everything you want. But I'm a queen. <laughs> but, you know, he doesn't ask for much. I want it. <laughs> and so they devised a plan. And the plan was this. You see, when she had come to the palace, she had brought her own physician, her own doctor with her. And for a little bag of gold, the, 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 the maid, she went out and she said to the physician, will you tell the king that the queen is ill? She's very sick, very pale, <coughs> very flushed with fever. And you have divined that the only thing that will save her is that pearl ground up in milk that she must drink. I'll do that said the vizier. I'll do that indeed. So he goes and he tells the king and the king goes, mm, now he's not foolish and he knows exactly what has happened. And he said, yes, yes, I will make a present of it to the physician tomorrow. Well, the maid goes back to the little queen and says, he's going to give it to the physician tomorrow. And she says, we've got to go and watch. So they're behind the screen watching and the physician comes out and he says, I've come for the pearl so I can prepare it to help the queen. And the king looks and says, yes, but physician, you are old and, and your knuckles are hard. He said, you cannot crush such a pearl. He claps his hands and a mortar and a pestle, which is like a, a big stone bowl with a big stone crushy thing. That's the technical term for it. <laughs> and he takes from his sleeve the pearl. And he says, let me crush it for you. Oh. And he grinds this pearl to dust. He says, there you go. Now you can put it in milk. Now what he hears is a thump from behind the screen <laughs> because the poor young queen has gone ah! and passed out. <laughs> now and the maid can't carry her, so she's having to drag her back by the ankle, which is a very unqueenly way to travel. But she manages to get her back and get her in bed, and she's crying and she's flushed, and, and the king arrives and he says, the, the physician, for some reason, fled. So I've brought you your medicine yourself. And she watches as he pours this crushed white wonderfulness into a glass of milk, stirs it up and says, there. I feel sick, she says. Well, I'm sure you do, my love, but drink this, you'll feel better. I don't want to drink it. She says, no, you must drink it all up. You'll feel so much better. And he hands it and she sits there like a child going, drink it all up. You look very flushed. There's too many sweetmeats. No, you're poorly. You look really feverish. She drinks the whole thing. And he says, now, my love, you must stay there and you'll feel so much better. And then he leaves because he has a kingdom to run. Well, a week of sobbing, two weeks of feeling very sorry for herself. But after about four weeks, a strange thing happens. Somebody comes to her and says, Madam, there is a, an old woman in the city and she has nothing to eat. And because she's young, but she's not unkind, she says, does this happen often? And they say, yes. And so she goes into the city and she sets up a place where you can come and you can have bread and you can get grain and you can get cheese and dates if you are poor and you have nothing to eat. And the next thing is she sets up something for the orphans and the widows. And she gets so busy doing all this that she forgets about the pearl. And nearly six months pass. And the king has been very busy. The borders have been beset with enemies. He finally comes back. And he, he's a little worried about the queen, but she's happy. She's doing all these wonderful things. And, 
and he has an audience with her. He goes to her chambers and he sits her down and he reaches inside and, of course, he takes out the pearl and he hands it to her. And she says, but I, I, I thought you crushed it. He said, no, what you saw me crush was an avocado seed. <laughs> but he says, never, ever mistake someone's kindness for weakness or foolishness. And she said, you know, I could think of so many uses for that pearl. And he says, well, I already have one now in my scepter. And she took that pearl and she sold it to a gem merchant whom there are many stories about. And she gave the money to the poor. And, you know, nobody in that kingdom ever again mistook kindness for weakness or foolishness. And my story is not many end like this. But they indeed lived happily ever after. Thank you very much. That was Shauna Lee with The Precious Pearl. Hearing Shauna Lee's story about the precious pearl makes me think of the important objects that stand at the center of some of our family stories. I had a friend who used to have a sword that hung on his wall in a scabbard right on the wall of his living room. His family had an ancestor famous to the founding of the area where he lived. And the family had preserved the ancestor's sword, handed it down. And actually, the real ancestor's sword went to my friend's brother when things were being handed down in the family. So my friend, well, he found one kind of like it at a pawn shop and hung that sword on his own wall. Do you have an object important to the story of your family? Strangely, I'm thinking of one right now. An old orange-handled pair of scissors that my dad used to cut our hair when we were kids once a month, on the front porch. Thinking of those scissors brings up memories of important talks during those haircuts, quiet conversations in which I learned some of the most important things I know about my dad, and he about me. That's where Shauna Lee's story took me. Where did the story take you, and who will you take along? It's a pleasure to be with you today on The Appleseed, and it's time for our second story, a terrific tale by Geraldine Buckley, who comes to us by way of Maryland, although like Shonnelly, she was born in England. Her story is a love letter to the nuns who helped raise her, women she treasures. Here's a story she calls The Lord of the Dance, recorded live in The Appleseed Studio. Well, it was the late 90s, and I was taking part in a poetry reading in Covent Garden in London, when a slightly inebriated older poet with eccentrically shaggy eyebrows swayed up to me, and he said, I really liked your Lord of the Dance poem. And I was thrilled because it was a poem I did a lot in those days. It was about my belief that Jesus created the world, and he did so by dancing it into being. It starts, O Lord, you are the dancing Lord, the swaying Lord, the swirling Lord, joy-soaked son of the living God. You laugh and love and leap. Yes, said the poet. He said, I liked it so much that it it inspired me to write a poem about dancing nuns. (laughs) And he swayed off. And I started to laugh because I'd known a few nuns in my time. And they started to pirouette out of my subconscious and flooded my mind for weeks afterwards. I remember that when I was six, my parents moved to a new house in the seaside village in the north of England where we lived. And just down the road from us, there was a large brick house, a convent, in which rattled eight Holy Child Jesus nuns and two trainee nuns, nun wannabes. <laughs> Well, my mother was loved nuns. In fact, we were, we were a good Irish Catholic family. My mother had been to a convent school, so she set out to spoil the nuns. 
Now, this was the mid-60s. She rented a minivan and she took all of them to see a film that had just opened. The Sound of Music. <laughs> the nuns loved it. <laughs> And, and Edelweiss and the hills are alive could be heard coming from their cloisters for years afterwards. <laughs> and she encouraged me to spend time there and I loved doing so. I was just entranced by the quality of silence that flowed through their sparsely furnished home. And then also there was a, a wonderful smell about the place. It smelt of, of beeswax floor polish and incense and holiness. And I love the nuns. There was tall, angular Sister Aloysius who trained me for my first Holy Communion. And then there was tiny, bird-like Sister Philomena who had a lump the size of a robin's egg on her head. Well, she taught me by example not to be so concerned about appearances. And then there was stately statesmen like Sister Austin. She tried to teach me calligraphy all the time telling me these incredible stories about her time as a missionary in China just at the beginning of the Cultural Re Revolution. She'd say, I was, I was there when, when the soldiers came and they took our Reverend Mother and they took her away and they shot her. And so we voted in another Reverend Mother and they took her away and they killed her also. And so we voted in another and they took her away. And she died as well. And then it was my turn. And I wasn't afraid to die. But before that could happen, the government ordered all the foreigners out of China. And I have missed China and prayed for it every day since. Well, I loved collecting things from the convent. Holy statues and holy pictures. And I put them in my room. And when I was about nine, my mother would say that every time she went in my room, she felt as though she should genuflect and cross herself. <laughs> Well, it was about that time after one of the visits to the convent that I came back and I said, Mommy, I know what I'm going to do with my life. And my mother said, do you, darling? What? What are you going to be? And I said, Mommy, I'm going to be a nun. And my mother's face clouded over and she said, absolutely not. No, she said. In our family, she said, we go to convents to get a good education to become fine young ladies. We do not become nuns which confused me because I knew she loved the nuns. And it still confuses me a little, but, but still, she clearly had other plans for my life. But even so, just before my 11th birthday, she said, Geraldine, would you like to go away? Would you like to go to boarding school? And now, I really wanted to go. I said, oh, yes, please. My parents were, were planning to move to Spain, which is just a, a short hop, skip and a jump from England. So I was excited to go and I was really looking forward to the interview. And my mother arranged five different interviews, but the one that I liked from the moment I read the brochure was one called Paul's Convent FCJ. That's the Order of Nuns, the Faithful Companions of Jesus. And it was set in a 500-year-old manor house with its own extensive parkland. And I loved it from the moment we drove through the huge black iron gates down the long winding path. There were cows on either side and enormous ancient sweeping cedar trees. And we drove up to the front of the manor house that was all brick with different colours of bricks swirled in. And it had stone window ledges and mullioned windows and an enormous oval oak door. And my mother and I crunched over the gravel and we knocked on the door and it was opened by a tall nun in full black habit. And she said, welcome, welcome. My name is Sister Ethna. That is like the volcano, Mount Etna, but with a th. Sister Ethna, welcome. <laughs> and she swept my mother and I into the, the hall. I had never seen anything like the hall. It was all lined in ancient oak. There were ancient oak floorboards. All the walls were intricately carved oak. And there was an incredible smell about the place. It smelt like the convent down the road. It smelt of, of beeswax floor polish and incense and holiness. But there was more. When that door first opened, it was as though a wave of love had come out of that place, almost like a tsunami, and it encircled me. It was, it was physical. I felt as though it was encircling me, picking me up and taking me in. I knew that school had chosen me. And I knew that I had to say whatever it took to go there. And my life would be completely different if I didn't go there. And I must have said the right things because I was accepted. And I started the September after I turned 11. 
Well, the nuns knew when to be stern and they knew when to look away. And that wave of love that had, that had entranced me and captured me when I went for an interview, it caught up with me my last term there when I was 15 going on 16. I had this huge desire to spend time in the chapel praying. I went to mass every day, but I wanted more. Now, the only time that I could go was at night. Now, for the senior girls, that was us. You had to be in bed by 10 o'clock. That was lights out. You weren't allowed to speak after lights out. Never mind get up out of bed. But I'm afraid I disobeyed. I would get out, I would wrap myself in my quilted dressing gown, and I'd slip down the long, cold corridors to the chapel. And if any nun saw me, they would pretend that they hadn't. They would press themselves against the wall and then slip away like oiled shadows. <laughs> and I would sit in the back of the chapel that was very dimly lit with, with low lights and candlelight. It was half light. And I would listen to the nuns chanting their holy office. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And I'd watch the dust motes floating through that half light and I would feel deeply humbled and strangely moved. Well, this went on for a few weeks and then I said, oh, all right, Lord, okay, then I'll do anything you want with my life. Now, that felt good. That felt good. But then I put it through the only filter that I knew, which was a Catholic filter, and I said, oh, well, all right, that means that I've got to be a nun. Well, that was never going to happen. <laughs> It was, now, nuns take vows of, of poverty, obedience, and chastity. I was 15. I just discovered boys, and I really rather like them. <laughs> <laughs> and I've never been terribly good at being told what to do. And then I remembered my mother's reaction when I was nine, and I knew she'd be furious. And so I just put it out of my mind. However, the nuns had really been taken note. So one day, Sister Benignus, who, of course, we call Sister Big Knickers... <laughs> She was in charge of polishing all those oak floors and she would do the main floors with the machine, but not the chapel. She would do that every day, polish it on her hands and knees. She said it was her daily meditation and her gift to the Lord. Well, she looked up from the polishing one day and she said, Geraldine, she said, the nuns are all praying for you. We believe you're going to be a nun, which is nun speak for you're going to be one of us. You have a vocation. This is serious. And I thanked her. But I was at the end of my term, my last term there, and, and I left, and I went to a sixth form college in Oxford, and I only saw Sister Ethna and a couple of the other nuns one more time. And that was my very last term at Oxford. And I heard that Sister Ethna and some of the other nuns were going to be at a charismatic conference. So they were going to be learning about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and how to worship the Lord with your whole body except I don't know if I knew that at the time, and even if I did, whether I would have understood. But I found out where the Mass was going to be on a Sunday, and I bicycled down there, and I got to the ancient church, and it had another oval oak door, and I rapped on the door, and eventually it was opened by a small nun. And she said, I'm sorry, you can't come in here. This is a private conference. I said, well, sister, sister, my old, my old headmistress is in there, Sister Ethna, and I know she'd really want to see me. And it looked as though she was going to say no, so I played my trump card. I said, and sister, I really, really want to go to Mass. Now, no nun is going to refuse a teenage girl when she says she wants to go to Mass. <laughs> and so she said, well, all right, she said, but it's a silent retreat, so you won't be able to speak to, to her. And it's in a hall. They'll be on the other side of the room, but at least you'll be able to see her. So that's what happened. She took me in. It was in a large hall. The Mass had already started. I waved at Sister Ethna, who looked very surprised. And in the middle of the Mass, at an appropriate time, Sister Ethna got up and with two of her friends, they were all in the black habit, she looked at me very shyly and then she went to one end of the room and she started to dance. The three of them started to dance. Well, what they did down this corridor, down this hallway, was they ran and then they flung themselves in the air with their arms and legs out and they dropped. And then they ran and again they flung themselves in the air, arms and legs extended. And again they ran and they threw themselves in the air and they looked like great black birds soaring. And again I was strangely humbled and deeply moved. But then I left academia and I lost all contact 
with nuns. And I went down some dark labyrinthine paths that I know that it was the prayers of my mother, but also those nuns that stopped me going too far down, far enough that it might have been hard to come back. And so I believe it was because of those prayers when I was in my early 30s, that wave of love caught up with me again. And I had a Damascus Road experience in a Pentecostal church, fell irrevocably in love with the Lord, gave up my PR business, went to Bible school, became a minister and followed an old love in a new way. And then it was several years after that that I did the poetry reading in Covent Garden and I met the poet, and started remembering nuns. But then I moved over here to America, and I, I, I lost contact again, even thinking about nuns, except I had a school friend who was a Facebook friend who told me, she kept me up with the news, and she told me that polls had been sold. All the nuns were dispersed to different convents, but she gave me Sister Ethna's address. And so I wrote her and I sent her a tape. It was a tape in those days. A tape of poems that I'd done and included was Lord of the Dance. And I got this absolutely wonderful letter back from Sister Ethna going, oh, Geraldine, it was so good to hear from you. And I am delighted that you love the Lord. And I was thrilled with the tape. It was as though we were back in polls for me to hear you doing poetry again. And I am so grateful for the prayers of those nuns, from the, the nuns from the, the convent down the road and from polls. It must be said, though, if they had known that I was going to end up being a Pentecostal preacher, they would probably have stopped praying immediately. <laughs> or at least redirected the flow. But I'm so grateful for them. I'm so grateful for their prayers and also for their godly example. And so whenever I think of any of them, I think of them dancing. Geraldine Buckley with The Lord of the Dance. Thanks for being with us today, and thanks to Shauna Lee and Geraldine Buckley for their stories. We hope listening today brought to mind some of your own stories about the people and things you treasure. We hope you'll share those stories with the ones you love. After all, sharing and listening to great stories can change your family's world. The Apple Seed is produced by Wendy Folsom, Sam Payne, and Brian Tanner. Our audio engineers are Ashton Parkinson and Carly Wilson. The rest of the Apple Seed team is Kelly Wehrmeister, Trent Horton, Evadane Hendricks, Miriam Arce, and Tristan Schetzel. A special thanks to the subscribers of our podcast who rate us or leave reviews. You help people find the show. We also love to receive emails at the Apple Seed at BYU.edu. Your thoughts and comments help us to shape the future of The Appleseed. We're pleased and proud to be among the many podcasts produced by the BYU Radio family. And you can find episodes of The Appleseed wherever podcasts are found, on the BYU Radio app or at byuradio.org slash appleseed. I'm Sam Payne, and the whole team can't wait to be with you again on The Appleseed.